This is Philosophy Bites with me, Nigel Warburton. And me, David Edmonds. If you enjoy Philosophy Bites, please support us. We're currently unfunded and all donations would be gratefully received. For details, go to www.philosophybites.com. Self-control is an essential quality for everyone. There's evidence that people who are good at self-control are good, are successful at life. Philosophically, the issue of self-control plays into the free will debate. If we can't control ourselves, in what sense are we free? Pat Churchland is a philosopher famous for incorporating into her writings and into her ideas developments in neuroscience. She's happy to call herself a neurophilosopher. Appetite whetted? Can't control yourself any longer? Unable to defer gratification? Here she is. Pat Churchland, welcome to Philosophy Bites. Oh, it's super to be here. I love being in London. The topic we're going to focus on is neuroscience and self-control. What do you understand by self-control? Usually, as a good working definition, we have sort of four things in mind. That if someone or an animal can display deferred gratification, that is deferring a smaller value now for something greater later, if they can maintain a goal despite distraction, if they can suppress impulses that are inappropriate, if you're a predator, for example, you mustn't rush at your prey too soon, and if you can cancel an action once started when you see that following through with the action would be a disaster. And I suppose the opposite of self-control would be something like impulsivity or possibly addiction. Yes, I think that addiction, which of course has been very closely studied both in humans but particularly in the brains of rodents, addiction is an example where there are structural changes to the reinforcement learning system that actually change the behavior with respect to the drug in question. And so impulsivity will be shown there. But notice that even drug addicts can be very careful and organized when it comes to a particular goal, namely getting their drug. So this actually has prompted some neuroscientists to wonder whether some of these features of self-control are actually dissociable. You mentioned these four marks of self-control. Is it the same mechanism underlying all these, do you think? It kind of looks like not, which is sort of interesting because we tend to think of self-control or free will as a sort of single capacity disposition. And it does look like they can come apart. So for example, Trevor Robbins, who studies both the behavior and the circuitry in rodents, has the following experiment. If you put in a food tower where the rat can come into the area, poke his nose on a button, he'll get a pellet. Put in a second food tower. If he goes to the second one instead of the first and pokes his nose on the button, he gets five pellets. Well, that's a good idea. But now what Trevor Robbins does in order to test for deferred gratification is he introduces a delay between when the rat nose pokes and when the pellet comes down. And the question was, can rats learn to do this? The answer is very interesting. Some rats will wait, and they will wait and wait, and other rats cannot. Now, a different kind of test is, can rats cancel an action they've started? So you have your food tube, the rat goes in and pokes his nose and gets a pellet. The rat is trained so that if he hears a tone, he stops. Then you can figure out how close can the rat get and still stop. And the answer is some rats can get really close. The nose is right up there, and some rats cannot. Now are the rats that can cancel the same as the rats that can defer gratification. There's some overlap, but not entirely. So then what Robbins and his crew did was looked at the circuitry. And the circuitry is somewhat different, which I think is very interesting because it means that not all of these four markers are exactly the same disposition but differently expressed, they actually have different underlying circuitry. I find that amazingly interesting. It teaches us something we couldn't have known by introspection. You could introspect till the cows come home, and you wouldn't find out whether in your brain the circuitry for deferred gratification is the same or different from the circuitry for impulse control. You go, oh, it's not there. 
One of the great psychological experiments of all times was the one concerning self-control that was done by Walter Mischel and his colleagues at Stanford in the 1970s. And here is the very simple thing that they did. They brought young children, aged three and four, into a room. They put them on a chair with a marshmallow in front of them, and they said, you can have one marshmallow now or three when I come back in five minutes. Some children were able to defer gratification and some were not. So then what they did was they tracked how those people prospered and what their lives were like over the next 30 years. And it was very interesting to see that those who could, at age three, defer gratification were also those who went to college, who got good jobs, who had long-term relationships, who basically did quite well, whereas the others, it was a higher proportion who went on drugs, who had problems of one kind or another with their relationships and so forth. So this really motivated the work on the circuitry of self-control. What exactly is it? Can it be trained? Can we teach children to defer gratification if at first they're not able to? It's interesting that in the question of teaching self-control that you go straight away to the circuitry because most education <laughs> begins with a person. Most education does, but that's because we're reaching the circuitry by teaching the person. We reward the child when it's able to finish a job, when it stays focused on the job, when it would like to hit out and slug the other kid but manages to suppress the impulse. We reward that. And by rewarding the child in that way, what you're doing is modifying in a completely physical and structural way the underlying circuitry of the striatum and the nucleus accumbens. And ditto, of course, when you punish them. So he hauls off and he slugs the other kid and you say, all right, time out. He doesn't want to have a time out. The reward circuitry is modified. Is it actually possible to teach self-control? The experiment you described identify different levels of self-control in different people and the consequences for their life chances. But do we have any evidence that education of some kind can modify people's ability in this area? This, I think, is a little bit controversial. My sense of it amongst the developmental psychologists and developmental neurobiologists is they think that there is a really significant genetic component, but that depending on the kind of environmental support, it can be modified. Maybe not hugely, but maybe sufficiently so that someone who initially has poor capacity to defer gratification may actually come up in their abilities to do so. But fundamentally, we cannot answer that question very well at this point. Now, this is all really interesting psychology and neuroscience. But it's not obvious that the empirical discoveries here are part of philosophy. Now, why is this interesting to philosophers? Well, I tend to think of it in the following way. We, of course, are very interested in the notion of free will. And free will has to do with that capacity that allows us to make decisions such that we can be held responsible for those decisions. But notice then that that concept or that expression, free will, is really a mashup of two things. One is a descriptive component about whether you had the capacity, which I assume is a neurobiological capacity, to act in a controlled manner. And the other part of it is the social aspect. Should you be under these conditions held responsible? My feeling is that the second part we should, just for this discussion, put to the side. And that's something that's extremely important and it needs to be talked about in the context of law and neuroscience and philosophy. But I'm really interested in what we can find out and what we know about the underlying circuitry. What's the difference between a brain that does have a capacity for self-control and one that does not? And when conditions change, what changes in the brain that allows someone to exercise impulse control or to fail? To exercise it. For some people, the assumption that everything can be explained in terms of cause and effect, which is essentially what we're talking about with the neurocircuitry and the chemical uh, transmitter substances and so on, it doesn't leave any room for free will because free will is something beyond a merely causal explanation. Libertarians, at least, tend to think that any cause of my decision tends to vitiate the free willness of that decision. 
I tend to look at it in a different way. And in a sense, I'm very sympathetic to David Hume, who realized full well, in contradistinction to, say, Descartes, that there bloody well better be causes. There better be desires and beliefs and intentions and motives and background knowledge if my decision is to be free. As Hume knew, what we really want to be interested in are the differences between the causal circumstance such that I don't have control and the causal circumstance such that I do. And one of the things that we have learned from the addiction studies in neuroscience is what kinds of changes in the underlying circuitry make impulse control very difficult for addicts. I can imagine we discover that a room full of addicts have a huge range of different capacities for self-control. And then what follows from that? I know that some people find it easier than others to keep off the drugs, but what does that show me about free will? Of course, we're very interested in the practical question of what we can do to intervene in the system to make it easier. But we're also, I think, really interested in understanding the nature of the neurobiological changes so that people can better be forewarned, so that kids, for example, don't think that it's just fun to take a shot of cocaine. If they understand that it gives them permanent, so far as we know, permanent changes to certain aspects of the reward system, they might go about things in a very different way. And we may also find that there are correlations between certain psychological interventions and the circuitry that regulates various aspects of self-control. So there are, I think, very practical implications here. I was thinking you might have responded in terms of almost the myth of free will, that there are some philosophical approaches which assume that every person has extensive freedom of choice about how they act and what things they choose to pursue and the neuroscience seems to point in a different direction there's a whole range of capacities and we don't all have this underlying ability to make decisions about our lives in important areas yes i think that one of the things that has permeated philosophical discussions especially those of the libertarians regarding free will is the kind of romanticism And quite honestly, you have to say at a certain point, when the facts are as they are, that as regards free will, once we're able to characterize what it is for a system to have good self-control, that's as good as it gets. Consider somebody who was an architect, who really liked the idea that up is up there and down is down there, and down is absolute. And then we say, well, look, you know, Down actually isn't absolute. Absolute depends on where the center of gravity is. And then he goes into shock and he said, but then there is no real downness. And we said, no, 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 no. Downness is just relative. That's as good as it gets. And he said, no, it's not good enough for me. If downness isn't absolute, then I don't want any part of it. I can't build my buildings. And you want to say, wait, that's silly. And I think with regard to libertarian notions of free will, we kind of have to say, look, self-control is real, and dysfunction of self-control is real, and this is as good as it gets. And there's a big difference between the self-control of someone like Bernie Madoff, who ran his Ponzi scheme for 25 years, and someone who is delusional. So we have to take those differences into account. One of the things that strikes me about free will and self-control is that most of us delude ourselves about the extent of self-control. There's plenty of evidence in terms of situations and environments that affect us without us realising it. There are all kinds of things about our neurochemistry which affect us without our realising it. How important is this idea of the overestimation of self-control? That is actually a beautiful question because, of course, it has long been known that alcohol reduces self-control. And if you're a libertarian, you must wonder, how the heck does that happen? You know, I've got this pure will. How can it be affected by alcohol? We know it's affected by other substances. It's affected by stress, by sleeplessness, by hunger, by all kinds of things. And so if you want to have an idea of the purity of the will as being separate from all of these causal conditions, you're in a bit of a bind, actually. This discussion we've been having is an example of the 
interface between neuroscience and philosophy, it seems to me, and what has come to be known as neurophilosophy. I wonder if you could say a little bit about neurophilosophy. Well, I think that the core of it really is illustrated by this example regarding self-control, but I think there are other examples involving morality and social functions uh, and also regarding consciousness and sense of self. The basic point being that mental functions are, so far as we can tell, functions of the physical brain. And not all aspects of our mental functions are revealed in introspection or in conceptual analysis. And that if we really want to understand them in a thoroughgoing way, we need to be able to take advantage of the discoveries in the neurosciences. And so when it comes to these kinds of questions about what self-control really is, it's very exciting to see that there are things that we could not have discovered by introspection. As neuroscience continues to make deeper and deeper discoveries about mental functions, we will indeed change many of our old ideas about what, say, consciousness is or morality is or knowledge is. What would you say to the objection that, look, it's not brains that exercise self-control, it's people that exercise self-control. People should be the unit of thought, not brains. Well, how am I going to do that exactly? When there is damage to a bit of circuitry so that a person can no longer exercise adequate impulse control, I could say, so John can't exercise adequate impulse control, but at some point I really want to explain why. And the details of why have to do with the details of the circuitry. If people really object to that, then by all means, they should take the longer phraseology and say that it's John. Fine, do that, by all means. But many of us want to have a sort of abbreviated shorthand for getting on with the job. And when we do that, we want to say, this part of the brain exercises self-control. That is, for example, the prefrontal cortex, whereas the visual cortex does not. And if you insist that I put that in terms of persons, I want to say, oh, yes, 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 you know, we don't quit being fussy. If you're right, some philosophers should be out of their armchairs and probably out of their jobs. Well, I certainly think that lots of philosophers should be out of their armchairs. If what you want to know are things about the nature of the mind, and if you think you can know what needs to be known simply by introspection and conceptual analysis and talking to other philosophers, I would bet serious money that you're wasting your time. Pat Churchland, thank you very much. Thank you very much. For more Philosophy Bites, go to www.philosophybites.com. You can also find details there of Philosophy Bites books and how to support us.